All right. I'm so glad to have Matt Stoller, Research Director for the American Economic Liberties Project, back on the podcast. Of course, you also know him from his amazing Substack, Big, to which I am a subscriber. Welcome back, Matt. Thanks. Thanks. I am amazing. It's really, you're really lucky to have me on to talk about so many important things. Look, I'm, real real talk. I reached out to you first off to talk about this prospective airline merger, but then right. there are all these other news events that keep bubbling up that you're kind of uniquely suited to talk about. Um, oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm no, I'm no flatterer, Matt, but these, the, this is just the truth of the situation. You did a really interesting kind of, I think, nuanced thread uh, giving your take on the hearing uh, on the Twitter files with Matt Taibbi and Michael Schellenberger right. la- uh, last week. And additionally, there is this uh, bank collapse out west that is all over the news. And which I would love for you to help us understand. So, do you have a preference with which uh, about which one we start with? No, I mean, so there's the there's airline consolidation in general, right? Mm-hmm. Which is like fascinating. And then you've got the Twitter files and like the FTC, and then you've got Silicon Valley Bank, the collapse of that, and that whatever you want. Oh, I even and I left off. Obviously, the very first thing I reached out to you to talk about was whether or not there were any kind of antitrust implications with the derailment in East Palestine, whether or not there was um, kind of a top level explanation for how some of this stuff happened. So how about how about we start just superficially with that one? You know, I kind of went out on a limb, but I was just curious, given how few railroad companies there are, it seemed to me that consolidation had to be some part of the story of how we get to a place where there's very few companies that are, as a consequence, perhaps more sub- susceptible to the kind of corporate capture that we've seen in the case of Norfolk Railroad. Am I am I going too far out on a limb there? No, that's right. I mean, there's so there's different kinds of industries, and some of them, you know, when you're like selling ice cream, you can have lots of competitive firms. Uh, but there are other kinds of industries like railroads and and shipping and um, uh, airplanes, where airlines, where you know you you're dealing with a network system. And so while you want to have a bunch of rivals, you also need to have regulation for a variety of reasons. And so with railroads, there's two, there's there's sort of two great sins, um, which is the same thing with airlines and shipping is the first you saw the removal of public rules. And that's, we call that deregulation, but really what's shifting rule setting from the private or from the public sector to like a small group of financiers. And then the second was a series of, of, uh, roll-ups, consolidation. And they're related because um, effectively, they, because you, it's cost so much to build a, a railroad or, or an airplane costs like so much money, um, only a, it creates a, di- and you need a network to run it. Um, it the, the dynamic is, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just, I'm, a bunch of people are bothering me, so I'm having to quit a bunch of applications, <laughs> which I forgot to do. No uh, but the marginal cost, like when you're flying an airline, or um, the marginal cost of bringing someone, one other passenger, one extra passenger is zero. And uh, because the, the most of the cost of running an airline, and this is true for railroads or any high capital cost industry, most of the cost is in just building the network itself. And once mm-hmm. you've built the network and once you're doing the flying or, the, or moving freight or whatever it is, then having an additional amount uh, to, to bring or an additional person doesn't cost you anything because you're already moving it. And so the incentive there when you're in a competitive system is like if there's a competitor that's flying uh, the same route or that's, you know, bringing um, rail on, on the same route, you will actually lower your, pro- your, your price lower than your overall cost of capital, lower than the cost that it, it um, uh, the amount that you borrow to build the whole network. And so you have this tendency for these systems to go into structural insolvency, which in the 19th century, they used to call ruinous competition. If you have a bunch of railroads that are competing with each other and there's no price setting, then they'll all go bankrupt. And when they all go bankrupt, then someone will come in and consolidate them and the price setting will happen. It'll just happen through monopolization. And what Mm -hmm. we learned over about a hundred years from the 1820s to about the 1920s is that you're going to have price setting. So what you want to do is make sure that you have public price setting so that uh, you don't have uh, a, a railroad operator or an air, airline operator or someone just cutting off service to swaths of the country, which is what was happening. So when we got rid of 
regulation of railroads and regulation of airlines. And it happened with railroads in um, basically the rough 1980 or so, although the railroads went bankrupt in the late 1960s where the airlines were, were doing fine. Um, when we, we got rid of, of uh, regulation in railroads in 1980 with something called the Staggers Act, um, that sort of allowed railroads to just set their own prices, to keep their prices secret. And it also, uh, and, and, and to cut lots of service to a bunch of different areas, which in some ways they needed to do, but, but in a lot of ways they, they did more than they should have. And then, uh, then, then they started, there were a series of mergers as a result. And so we used to have dozens of railroads that were competing. And now we have what are called um, seven class one railroads that have essentially kind of monopolized regions of the country. And one of the consequences of a monopoly is lower quality of service, right? So what hap- what is a lower quality of service with railroads? Well, it would be things like delays, which there are a lot of, a lot of shippers complain about it. Like the CEO of DuPont was complaining about how railroads treat their workers badly. What that meant is that they couldn't get their, chem- they couldn't move their chemicals as easily. Hmm. Um, there were, uh, there were huge kind of holdups during the pandemic and the supply chain crisis because the railroads kept laying people off and making their trains longer and making it uh, less efficient, but also less safe. Um, and then, uh, and then you have safety standards. So if you have a, a monopolist, they will often, you know, lower quality means that this stuff is not as safe. And so, you know, then there's also the political power that these railroads have. And that political power is not just lobbying, right? I mean, lobbying is one thing. It's also that they can just say, if you don't do what we want, we won't carry your stuff. Right. Mm. So they've actually they're actually core infrastructure. Like if you're a if you're a fertilizer mixer and you need certain chemicals, right? You're you're off a rail spur, you need that railroad. Like you don't have a choice. And I mean I guess you could truck it in, but that's much more expensive. So um so these guys have power because they can just say, you know, we're just not gonna do what you want and you can't make me. I mean when when it, when they these railroads were regulated. The government could make them and they, they made money. They were, they were, you know, they would put in a dollar of capital and they were guaranteed to make, you know, 7% off of it. But now it's a, it's an entirely different model. And these railroads are incentivized to do a race to the bottom. So, to spend so help as me little understand, money as possible. L- let's just back up a little bit. I, I think I'm a little bit confused as to one, what motivated the choice to deregulate in 1980? I, I obviously understand that there's some bad faith excuses, but I want to know what the kind of stated rationale was, why it was necessary, and how right. that relates to what you were describing earlier about how the nature of these networks is that they're, they, they, they all collectively yeah, go bankrupt yeah. so, anyway. So, so we went from a public utility. These are public utilities, right? Mm-hmm. So these are public systems. They require public rights of way. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's some private infrastructure, but there's also public infrastructure. But they're private. They're privately owned, right? The the rails, the companies themselves are all. Because I, I was under the impression, frankly, that the railways were in in some ways p- publicly owned. But then I read that they were not. Well, no, they're they're private. So the 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 rail the freight rail firms are are private. They're private firms. But but you know the the FDR made a distinction between you know you and I owning like silverware and um, right. you know random telecom stuff. And then, companies and yeah no no like just ordinary people owning property like your yard right, right. between like that's, that that's just, and, and rail right, companies the, and telecom companies and these kind of public right what do you call the princes of property but the supreme court has made that distinction like we've had this goes back to you know you could go back to the 19th century if you wanted you know these, these are this is private property but it is quote unquote clothed with a public purpose right which is something that the Supreme Court said in the 1870s. Therefore, it's correct, right? Because some old, <laughs> old, old people said it. People a long time ago. As is, we know, everything that the Supreme Court said in the 19th century was right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no. But this was a widely, um, widely recognized that. And and today, you know, look, there's a lot of public infrastructure. Railroads connect to all sorts of um, infrastructure that the government builds. The same thing is true with, with um, airlines, you know, airports. These are not owned by American airlines. These, these, these airports are publicly owned. And, right? like, this, is, this is a mix of public and private infrastructure. And then railroads have certain legal rights with rights of way. They, uh, you know, you saw like the, a couple months ago, the, the settlement of the railroad um, labor dispute. You know, mm-hmm. that, that was the government telling workers what they had to accept. That is mm-hmm. not a, uh, 
you can call that private business if you want, but it's like kind of a silly distinction, right? This is a public private system. And anyway, it used to be regulated that way. We used to say, you can put cap- if you put private capital into this, we're going to guarantee you a return on this capital of a certain amount. And we're going to tell you what kind of prices you can charge and you run it however you want within the rules that we decide. And then in, and this was true for, for airlines as well. And in some ways shipping, although it was a little different. Um, but in the late seventies, right, there was, there, there was a, a sort of political movement that on the left and right that said, look, these rules don't make any sense. Okay. And there were reasons for this, right? Um, in the, the railroads have been kind of mismanaged since the 1950s. Uh, the reason being that the regulatory schema was built around the idea that the railroads were the, the monopoly of transportation, like it was the 19th century. To get around in the 19th century, you rode the railroads. And then uh, the trucking emerged, and we built highways for, for truckers. And we mm-hmm. built you know uh, this whole public infrastructure for trucking to move goods and services, and also for for rail uh, for for um, cars, so people could didn't have to take the rail the railroads, and then airlines too, right? So you know, it used to be that everything like it, railroads were subsidized through mail contracts. We moved the mail over mm-hmm. the railroads, and then now now we don't move it over railroads anymore. And so like they had competitors, the the airlines and um, and cars and trucks, but we didn't update the regulatory scheme. And so railroads started having really serious problems in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And ultimately, most of them went bankrupt in the 1970s. And the government just kind of nationalized it all for a while. Uh, not all of it, but a lot of it. And so in the 1970s, we kind of had this I'm debate. sorry. Uh, wait a minute. Did it actually nationalize the railroads in the 1950s or construct the national? What do you mean by that? In the 1970s? Well, it, you, Amtrak, I mean, is a public, that's government, right? That that didn't mm-hmm. like Amtrak was created in the 1970s, early 1970s. It was the result of the bankruptcy of a series of railroad uh, companies. Like Penn Central was the, I think it was the seventh largest company in America, and it went bankrupt in 1970. Out of that, came, and it's because they just couldn't, for a variety of reasons, but like essentially they couldn't, they were regulated poorly, um, and uh, kind of out of that, the government just went to these companies who said, we don't want to do passenger rail anymore. It's not profitable. The government just bought uh, all the pos- passenger rail and created Amtrak. Um, I see. And but just they, the passenger the rail? Also, no, no. They also bought, uh, they also owned a huge uh, rail company that they called Conrail because they bought a lot of assets out of out of Penn Central and out of a, a bunch of others and just and just ran them as as a government uh, as a government company. Conrail was a government company until the 1980s. And the reason that it like the, these companies were willing to do that, first of all, they went bankrupt. But second of all, um, they weren't allowed to shut anything down. So there were all of these ra- like rail spurs that didn't make any rational sense. But, um, you know, because when you can truck something a small distance, you don't necessarily need a rail spur. And and uh, but they couldn't get the political leaders in that area to let them close that, you know, rail spur down. Right. So. Uh, when they restructured it, when the government just took it out of bankruptcy and made it a government company, the government like restructured it and shut down a lot of the unprofitable routes. And Conrail was super successful under government control. Mm. Uh, and then f- to the point where the existing freight rail companies really wanted to buy Conrail because it was making so much money for the government. And they ultimately did. Um, and so that, and in, in uh, the, I think it was 1980 or 1979, something the Carter administration passed the Staggers Act, which lifted rules for private rail companies. And the idea there, and this was the same, it was consistent with the deregulation of the airlines, um, was the airline deregulation law was also 1980, the deregulation of trucking, the deregulation of uh, telecommunications, of banking, all of this happened under, uh, starting under Carter. We are chopping down the thicket of unnecessary federal regulations by which government too often interferes in our personal lives and our personal business. We've deregulated the air industry, the rail industry, the trucking industry, financial institutions. And, um, and they believed, and this wasn't, this wasn't just, this wasn't, was not bad faith. I mean, Ted Kennedy's attack on Jimmy Carter in 1980 was that Carter hadn't gone fast enough on deregulation. Mm. Um, so this is not like the left was opposing it. The left was super into this. The left in some ways was more aggressive on deregulation. And the theory there was, well, we have big government, which is super corrupt. We have um, uh, big business, 
and big labor and this troika of big business, big labor and big government are causing huge inflation and harming the consumer. And so the way we need to deal with this is we need to get rid of this unholy alliance and foster competition. And the way to do that is to lift all these rules and deregulate. And then uh, then you get rail and trucking and shipping, and they'll all compete with each other. And uh, we'll break the Teamsters. I mean, the Alfred Kahn, the guy you know who was very, who was like in charge of a lot of this, he really wanted to break the Teamsters because they thought the Teamsters were thugs and they were paid too much and they were causing inflation. I mean, there was a real anti-labor sentiment here as well. So, and, and they believe that, it, that's not bad faith. That's just what they thought. Right, I'm just a little like con- corruption. I'm a little confused because you're telling me, at least on the railroad side of things, that at this point it's constructively nationalized. The government is running Conrail. It's very profitable. Right. If the government is concerned that the company that it owns is too expensive, there's too much inflation and it's hurting consumers, then why, and it's very profitable for the government, why is the solution not just to lower its own prices? Well, so so there were other private railroad companies as well, right? So it wasn't like Conrail was one part, was one, uh, you know, they only took over assets from from some railroad companies. There were a bunch of other railroad companies. So there is there was that, competition already is what you're telling me. <laughs> um, there there was, comp- I mean, these the railroad companies work, they weren't just competing with each other. They were also competing with air and, and uh, highway with trucks. air and trucks, right? So yeah, there was, um, there was, it, it was a competition reasonably competitive system. The problem that these railroads have, so the Western railroads were, you know, they had been built a little bit later. They weren't as constrained. And also like the biggest, the other problem is that a lot of economic activity had moved out of the Northeast and moved to the South and the West. Mm -hmm. And so the railroad, the business of these railroads changed. It's like, okay, if you're not carrying as much steel, because they're not making as much steel anymore in Pennsylvania, your business is kind of screwed. And if you, if the government doesn't let you cut service, then what, what, how, how are you supposed to stay in business? And, um, you know, and that, and the, you know, the executives were also running the railroads really badly. Like what the, there were, there were many problems, but yeah, I mean, essentially it was a rel- relatively competitive system, but the rules were not set up. Well, the rules were, had been set up for a different time period. And so, what needed to happen in the 70s was an updating of these rules to basically say, OK, we'll have we have a transportation system that has a bunch of different modes of transportation and we need to regulate it that way instead of regulating just railroads and just trucks and uh, and just airlines. Like sometimes you want to take a packet like a, a box and move it on a ship, put it on a railroad. Uh, and then, you know, truck it somewhere and you need to regulate it like that versus the idea that this is, you know, 1920 and you're moving, you know, you're just taking something on a railroad from one place to another. And mm. that is that is what we never kind of managed to do. This was called multimodal regulation um, or multi, a multimodal transportation sector. And so instead of doing that in the 1970s. Uh, the, there was kind of these ideological debates, essentially, like, do we, you know, do we just have the government own everything? Or do we just kind of like, throw it into a giant, like super competitive maelstrom, and kind of try to get the government out. And that's ultimately the direction that we went with, because a lot of the consumer rights people, um, the kind of like baby boomers on the left, agreed with the a lot of conservatives who said, we want to get the government get rid of basically get rid of the New Deal. Um, and that's and that was kind of the Carter administration was essentially getting rid of the New Deal uh, in terms of our public governance of industry. Mm. And then Reagan changed the rules around consolidation. So that's when you, you you had all of these like highly competitive markets. But, you know, a lot of entrance into, well, airlines, not necessarily rail. But um, but then you started to see lots of bankruptcies. And that's when the consolidation really hit. And then there was consolidation aside from that, because you know, if you can consolidate and you're a CEO of a company, like why, why wouldn't you, if you can just like gain market power that way. So you you saw tremendous consolidation in the eighties and nineties, and there was no, uh, there was no check on these firms because, you know, the, the ability of the government to, um, to control pricing was gone. Now there was still some residual ability, like the government could, for example, and I guess still can, um, if they if they think there's monopoly power on a route, they can I, they could set pricing, but they they never do that. Mm. Um, and so I think like that's 
that's kind of where we are. We need a complete, I think we're starting a real rethink of, um, uh, of public governance of our, um, of our network industries. Like you're seeing this across the board and, and it really is like kind of a revolution in America right now. We're in the early stages where we're getting out of this weird kind of 19, 19- 70s 1980s model where we're just like well nobody has to pay attention to everything the magic market will just provide back to a a a recognition that we have to if we want a country that makes things and and can do you know basic is has some basic competence then we need to actually pay attention to the details whether that's like CEOs or labor union leaders or policymakers or whoever it's like you can't just like say, all right, well, um, you know, we'll throw some money at it and, and it'll all get fixed. You actually have to pay attention to. Yeah. And to that end, to you've written recently in your sub stack about the accountability that's kind of unexpectedly perhaps come down on Pete Buttigieg and how for years the Secretary of Transportation was a position that nobody paid much attention to. I think right. you mentioned that. Was it Bush that uh, that appointed a Democrat? And then yeah, Norm Mineta. The- and then nobody really cared about what Elaine Chao was doing. Um, and now here, Buddha Judge, um, kind of a uh, the emerging prince of the future of democratic politics, has been put in this position where he's right. getting a lot of heat. Uh, much most of which you agree is very much in good faith and warranted because there is so much that a secretary of transportation actually does have in his individual his or her uh, individual capacity a lot to do. So this brings us uh, an ability to do rather. So this brings us to this question of this airline merger. Now, um, the attorney general has said that JetBlue acquiring Sprint will eliminate the largest ultra low carrier in the United States. Uh, low cost carrier in the United States, limit choices and drive up ticket prices. A different take was articulated on Fox News recently, and I want to get your response to this clip. This merger that's, that Susan was talking about between Spirit and JetBlue, yeah. if I understood her correctly, she's saying the courts are basically blocking that. Mm-hmm. That's outrageous. Well, the and government. I trust. The, yeah, the, the government. That's outrageous. You're talking about Spirit and JetBlue. If they merge, they still have less than 20 percent of the market. How could anybody say that this is a monopolistic move? JetBlue is, a, is an airline because that has cut airline prices. I think this is outrageous. Is this administration big they, uh, exactly. They were against mer- and by the way, mergers and acquisitions are the way that small businesses become big businesses. What do you make of that, Matt? Is are mergers oh, and Steven, acquisitions the way forward for small businesses? Stephen Stephen Moore is adorable. <laughs> I love that guy. That guy. I, I I I am not a credential person, but I am going to make fun of him for a second because he has a, a master's degree in economics, which is what you do if you drop out of the PhD program. <laughs> and I, I don't. Is that the same thing as like a, a, an MBA? No, it, no, it's, like an MBA. It's not an MBA it's, track. It's not a PhD track. It's a, a kind of a failure just like middle you ground. Hack it. You couldn't hack it to get a PhD. So he's just, but he like often like brags about that. And I don't actually, I don't care if you um, are an economist or I don't think economists have that much. Um, I don't think. I think economists are as problematic as they are useful, but I like that he like pretends that he's an economist, but like couldn't, couldn't hack it. Um, so <laughs> anyway, um, uh, it's a, it's an incredibly stupid point. Um, so the, the law, the Clayton Act says that mergers that may substantially lessen competition are uh, unlawful. And what we have to realize is that, you know, the, the, uh, I think JetBlue is the sixth largest airline and Spirit is the seventh largest. So it's a pretty small merger as all things go. Mm-hmm. But the airline industry itself has has undergone tremendous consolidation in the last 30 years. Um, I can just like a couple of, here's a couple of mergers so that have happened. Um, so it's Delta bought Northwest, United bought Continental, American bought TWA, American West and US Air. And then the low cost carrier segment, Southwest bought AirTran, Alaska Air bought Virgin America. And then um, there's a JetBlue has a quasi merger with American Airlines via something called the, the Northeast Alliance. So there's been a lot of these are in the last 20 years, and I'm sure there's there's more that I'm missing. But you have four uh, airlines, the big four, that control 80 percent of routes, right? And that's American, Delta, uh, United, and uh, Southwest, right? And this and merger we, would make the combined resulting company the fifth largest airline. That's right. Um, so so this is in the context of a increasingly consolidated airline industry. And, you know, what you see in, in 
you can compare it to Europe where there's a lot of competition over airline routes. And in air, in Europe, the airlines make about uh, $7 per passenger per flight. And in the U.S., they make about $25 or $22, something like that, per passenger per flight. So the, the profit margins are much higher in the U.S. And when you, you see like um, when jet fuel prices go down, right, in Europe, there are usually the airlines – cut their prices. They, they have a price war to see who can get customers. In the US, they don't. Like They, they mm. just take the extra margin. And that's because it's not a competitive industry. Now, the way you understand airline competition is, um, is, like, is not who has the most of the national market, but individual routes. Because if you want to fly from like Boston to Miami, you don't care you know, who, who has flights from Chicago to LA, you care about Boston, who has, how many choices are there to go from Boston to Miami? And, um, and so you have to look at how many overlapping routes do these guys have and, uh, how consolidated are those routes going to be? Cause in a lot of routes, like there are four major carriers and then there's a few other airlines as well, but in most routes, there's like one or two choices. Right. And, in this case, you'd have about 150 routes that overlap and would become heavily consolidated by this merger. So you're basically removing a choice from a route that already doesn't has maybe two or three choices. So you're, you're in a lot of them, you're just moving to monopoly, and in in um, uh, in in some of them, you're moving from three choices to two, which is pretty substantial. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing about this merger that's crazy, and I don't say this about a lot of antitrust cases, I think this is a slam dunk for the government because mm. JetBlue already announced like they're going to rip out seats from Spirit planes and raise prices. So we already know what's going to happen, that like this is just going to raise prices across the board. And Spirit is a crappy airline. Uh, it's growing very quickly. It's a crappy airline, but it's also what's called an ultra low cost carrier. Yeah. And- when Spirit enters a, a market, prices uh, in that market drop by about 30%. And mm. not just for Spirit Airlines. So like if you're flying another – a lot of, I hear from a lot of people, I hate Spirit. I don't fly them. I fly other airlines, so I don't care about this. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Pr- Spirit makes prices go down for everyone, right? So you, you fly and, – and when Spirit leaves a route, prices go up. By about by seventeen percent, and this is according to like Spirit's own analysis, right? So this isn't like this is Spirit's own words. And then the the, the other the thing that's like kind of hilarious here is Spirit. There was a bidding war for Spirit last year. So Frontier, which is another really ultra low cost carrier, uh, was trying to buy Spirit, and then that fell apart because of antitrust scrutiny. And JetBlue also wanted Spirit at the same time, and and JetBlue made an unsolicited hostile takeover offer to spirit and spirits executives and their board was, they were like, we don't want this. And they actually, and they actually got some economists and aviation experts to look at the antitrust case and, and found that it was like blatantly unlawful. The, the merger, this is when they didn't want to get bought by JetBlue. And the CEO of, of spirit actually went on CNBC and said that it was a cynical offer that everybody knew it couldn't, it couldn't get through. And then they recommended to their shareholders, don't accept this offer. Because if you do, the DOJ is going to block it because it's really clear that JetBlue is going to raise prices and cut capacity. And there is a slide in that investor presentation that the DOJ put in their complaint. So this like this is a crazy, you know, and then and then like a, a little bit later, you know, when the Frontier deal collapsed, then Spirit shareholders said, well, we want to get bought by JetBlue anyway. And so the DOJ was, is just like all they're doing is going to the judge and saying, well, Spirit and JetBlue have both announced that this deal is like obviously illegal and they're going to be raising prices and cutting capacity. And that is a blatant violation of the Clayton Act. So I don't know well, what well, they're well, thinking. Well, help, help us understand, though, Matt, for those of us who didn't take antitrust law, including myself, one of my bigger law school regrets, what no, no, is – what? <laughs> well, I didn't <laughs> take it because I heard it was hard. But not now that I understand the implications and how relevant it is to daily life, I wish I understood better. But look – for those of people who might be asking the question, well, what's the difference between, you know, a lot of things are anti-competitive, but how do you distinguish what's just growth or as the gentleman on Fox said, how small businesses get bigger from something that is illegal under antitrust law? Right. So, so if you're, if you are, uh, if you're buying another company and then you have the ability to 
uh, to essentially deny a choice to a customer and then and force that customer to pay more. That's illegal. It's like straight up, right? Like if there are 50 ice cream makers, right? And one, one of them buys another one, you've reduced it to 49. And it's pretty unlikely that any of those remaining ice cream makers will have more market power, right? Like I, if, I, if that guy is like, well, you can't buy from this one ice cream maker anymore because I own him. So I'm going to raise my prices. The other, like, the other, the person can say, well, I have 48 other choices to go to. So right? it can't so just whatever. come down to a number though, right? Because then what's the number? Are you allowed to have 10 of something, 20 of something, Well, in this case, something? it's like if you want to fly, well, so it, it's basically the number is five, mm. right? If you have fewer than five, the prices are going to go up. That's what one economist found, John Quoca. So, so what you want in general is you want five, five rivals in a market. Um, this is, you know, on 150 routes around the, the country, they're, they're folk, they're concentrated in Florida and uh, Chicago and um, I think Boston, a couple of other areas. But like in those Puerto Rico, in those particular routes, you're cutting from three choices to two or two choices to one. And so, and you're also removing a company out of the market that uh, lowers prices. So, so it's, the, so it's not just the, that there's, I mean, because there's more than five airlines, but you're talking about the specific routes. Right. The specific there's, routes. There's fewer yeah. than five options on a given route. Yeah. Okay, yeah that's yeah. an important distinction. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt. No. And then, and I'm sorry for not being totally clear on this. This is just like, um, it's a, the other thing is, is that Spirit has a different business model than JetBlue. So, JetBlue used to be, you know, they used to call this the JetBlue effect when, when JetBlue started flying a route, like prices would drop because then mm. have, the bigger guys would have to compete with JetBlue. That used to be true, but now JetBlue is kind of like allies with the big guys. So what will often happen is American Airlines will signal it's raising prices somewhere and JetBlue will then raise its prices, right? Mm. Or, or, you know, or a, a comp- United will, will indicate we might lower prices on this route and JetBlue will say, well, if you lower prices on that route, we'll lower prices on this route. And then both companies will say, fine, we'll, we'll bring the price back. They don't, JetBlue doesn't like to get into price wars and they all like to follow uh, the leader to, to higher prices. This is one of the problems with the concentrated market. Um, Spirit is very well known for just saying, screw that. Our model is low prices and we're going to come in and have bad service and low prices and if we think we can take share, we will take share. And so they are what's called a maverick competitor, mm. where they come in and they operate differently. And uh, and so if you pull that maverick competitor out of the market, but also the seats are less comfortable. Like it's a shittier experience, but they it's charge also much you for cheaper. everything. Yeah, they charge you for everything, but it's like it's a it's a much cheaper experience. It's a different if it, it's a different um, business model. And JetBlue is like we're going to buy their planes. We're going to we're going to paint them our colors. We're going to rip out the seats. And we're going to raise prices. And that's going to fundamentally change a lot of parts of the industry. Because the other thing is Spirit is growing really quickly. So mm. Spirit is like threatening entry in all these other routes where like, and that has a disciplining effect as well on prices. So this is a really easy merger to block, even though it looks really small. And um, and it's it's like the kind of thing that, uh, you know, yeah. So So, and then the other thing is like, I want to give Pete Buttigieg some props. So I don't want to forget about that because this <laughs> sure. is something that like, I, as you know, I'm not um, the biggest fan of Pete Buttigieg and I'm sure <laughs> you, um, I know you are not. Um, and, uh, uh, but in this case, you know, one of the things that we've been saying to Buttigieg is, is, you know, th- there is merger law, right? Which is the Clayton Act and the antitrust division at the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. They have authority to enforce merger law. But it's hard to it's hard to prove or harder to prove that a merger is uh, going to reduce competition. Now, in this case, I think it's a slam dunk. But the Department of Transportation has a much easier standard. All they have to show is that a merger would be uh, a, by a bad for the what's called the public interest, and mm-hmm. that could be a whole bunch of other things. That can be like it's going to hurt workers. It's going to hurt you know, regions, it's going to, and it will, I mean, you you write in your sub stack that South Florida will certainly use, uh, lose spirits headquarters and the transportation workers union, which represents 6,800 jet blue flight attendants warns that more than 9,300 workers are at risk of losing their jobs. Yeah. There, there's definitely like a a public interest 
standard, uh, there's a public interest rationale for not uh, allowing this merger to go through. And the Department of Trust of, of Transportation has not blocked a merger like this um, really since the 80s. And we've been demanding that Pete Buttigieg step up and get more aggressive on the airlines. And he ha- really hasn't, uh, but but he's starting to. And this move to actually follow along with the antitrust division and say, yeah, well, I didn't say he did a move to actually follow along and say, yeah, we are considering we're doing an investigation to see whether this violates the public interest standard. That's a big deal because the Department of Transportation basically always just says, well, yeah, we'll transfer We'll transfer these routes automatically. We're not going to, you know, it's pro forma. And uh, and in this case, they're not doing that. In this case, they're saying, no, we're actually going to use our authority to block this merger. So I think that that it's a it's kind of a big deal. And, um, you know, the DOT people are lethargic. And Buttigieg does deserve credit for actually, you know, stepping up and doing for, it. Now, okay, obviously, look, there are reasons he did it. I'm not going to say <laughs> Matt, like, what you just described, like, I, I'm willing to give him credit when he does it. But Matt, what you just described is you've been pushing him to use authority, which he has, which he hasn't thus far, to do what the attorney general general's office is doing, but that he has indicated that he might move in that direction. I mean, I'll give him the sliver, the smallest sliver of credit when he actually does it. My my hands, which are about to clap, will finally come together. Well, no, I mean this is this is JetBlue is really angry, and the stock dropped when he did this. So it's uh-huh. not like it's not it's not meaningful. And the other thing okay. is that you know uh, he hasn't done uh, the DOT hasn't done this in since the 1980s. So this isn't like this is not a small thing, right? It's it's not it, it you know look. I mean, he has a lot to do to make up for to frankly learn the job. Um, but this is a real thing. And I, and I do think that it's important to acknowledge that this is a real thing that, that he's sort of starting to do. And, and I don't want to be in his, I'm very policy oriented, right? Like I have my political instincts. Um, and I mean, I, but, but the, the reality is that when somebody actually steps up and starts to govern, I think we should acknowledge that. And I think he's probably doing it for reasons like, oh, well, he has to, change the narrative because I think a lot of people are saying, well, it, why, what is this guy doing? And he needs to start doing stuff. And I think it's a good thing that, you know, he is actually stepping up and saying, well, in, in response to all this criticism, I'm going to maybe start governing all a right. little if, bit more aggressively. If, if That's Pete Buttigieg thing. starts to save face by actually helping uh, the American people, I will applaud that. But while, with the little time we have left, I want to go ahead and, and move on to this um, Silicon Valley bank issue. Now people have pointed out that just a mo- just last month, Jim Cramer of prediction of stock prediction fame said that Silicon Valley Bank was a buy at three hundred and twenty dollars a month. The ninth best performer year to date is SVB Financial. Don't you want this company's a merchant bank with a deposit base that Wall Street had been mistakenly concerned about. SVB is still Silicon Valley Bank. Recently bought one of our favorite research firms, Buffett Nathanson, and it's become less dependent upon private equity and venture capitalist offerings. Wait a second. Those dried up last year, they could come back. Yes, some of them come back here with the stock directly affects an oversold position. Stock was the fourth worst performer in 2022. I think the fears were not justified, and it's a very compelling situation. Hey, by the way, long-term private equity and venture capital, they're not going away. Being the banker to these invest, immense pools of capital has always been a very good business. Stock's still cheap. Now, you have to remember that a stock that falls 66%, like SVB Financial did last year, Oh, it takes it a lot more to recover. After losing two-thirds of your value, you need a 200% gain to get back to even. This is arithmetic. Some people call it geometry. So you could argue SVB's nearly 40% rally this year is barely a drop in the bucket. And that's how I want you to think it. I think it's also a good example of why these bounce-back moves might be far from over. These stocks could have more room to run especially if you think they were driven down to artificially low levels by tax law selling, artificial dumping, like we saw. Today, as we record, it's being closed by California regulators. What's going on there? <laughs> Aside from Jim Cramer. <laughs> I love Jim. I love Do you follow inverse Jim Cramer? No, Jim what's Cramer? inverse Jim Cramer? It's a Twitter account that just, uh, and I think they actually have a fund where you can invest the opposite of whatever Jim Cramer picks. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. Um, so I'm glad that you did that. Uh, even if you're not following the account, uh, I didn't know he said that about Silicon Valley bank, but it is hilarious. Uh-huh. Yeah. Silicon Valley bank is, um, it's, it's about $180 billion assets. 
um, and or maybe two hundred billion dollars of assets and one hundred eighty billion dollars of deposits. But it's a bank that lends to startups. It's used by a lot of venture capitalists and um, and and companies in Silicon Valley, and they got uh, they got caught um, holding a lot of of bonds that go down in value when interest rates go up and mm. interest rates went up and they went up really quickly. And so they have huge losses and their depositors. So you are protect the FDIC, which is a federal insurance company that protects your deposits. They have protect up to $250,000 of deposits that, so you're an insured depositor up to that amount, but above that you're uninsured. And 92% of depositors at Silicon Valley Bank are uninsured, right? They have more than $250,000 because a lot of them are businesses or wealthy people. And so they all started to pull their money out because they thought, oh my gosh, you know, Silicon Valley Bank may be shaky. And, um, and as a result, Silicon Valley Bank had to sell a lot of their bonds at a loss because mm -hmm. interest rates have gone up. So the price of bonds goes down. And... So there was a there was just this old fashioned bank run, and people just started pulling their money out as quickly as they could, and so then the government steps in and shuts the bank down and moves the assets to uh, to a a basically a government bank, a bridge bank, and then either sells the that bank to another bank and makes up the difference with government funds or um, uh, an in insurance funds that that are collected from the rest of the banking system, or it uh, liquidates the bank and moves the deposits to another bank. And it looks like this one's going to be liquidated. W were the people, were the depositors made whole then because of the government's inter intervention or do, were there still the losses? The depositors are going to be made, well, the shareholders are going to get wiped out, right? So the, the first, you know, in terms of the bank, who owns a bank, mm -hmm. uh, the, the people who own it are the people that own the stock. They're going to get nothing. Um, and then you have, the people that own bonds in the bank, they're probably going to lose a lot of their money. And then you have the depositors and you're going to be fine if you have $250,000 or less. And if above that, the um, FDIC is going to look at the assets that are there. And it could be anything from loans to startups, to bonds, to commercial loans, to commercial property or whatever. They're going to try to sell those assets they're going to pay back as much of the depositors as they can. Anything up to $250,000, you're covered. Above that, you just get what kind of assets are left after, you know, after they sell. You get the cash that's left after they sell everything. So you you did a segment on breaking points where you talked about the fact that Larry Summers, secretary former secretary of treasury, my former, all around solid uh, dude. All around solid dude. A guy who, I don't know if I've told this story in the podcast before, but on my first day of college, uh, he was my dean at the time, was standing, there was like a line of kids uh, queued up to have him sign a dollar bill, which at the, you know, which most of which had a, his signature on them at the time as secretary of treasury. Anyway, special guy. Uh he was using the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank to push for more banking consolidation, arguing that bigger ba banks are safer. Right. What's wrong with that? Well, I mean, he just uh, what's so bigger banks are not safer. Safer banks are safer. Um, mm, what makes them safer? You know, that, well, if they're well regulated, and mm. you know, you and look, you, what you want, you don't want your banks to be totally safe. You want banks to take risks. You want banks to lend money, and sometimes there are going to be some banks that are going to lend money, and a bunch of the loans are going to, you know, are going to go on like our going to not pan out and that bank is going to have to go under and that you want that sometimes otherwise there's not risk in the economy and you want risk in the economy like anybody who's tried to borrow money from a bank for a commercial venture knows that it's you know it's hard to get a bank to lend you money even if you have a good business and so we don't want to have totally safe banks but what um what larry summers wants is something like canada where canada has i think four or five major banks and that's it and america has about four or five thousand banks and a lot of the banks are small. Um, some of them are medium sized, and then you have some really big ones. And he wants all the banks to be big ones because then the government, when they want to do anything, they can just call five guys, and then mm. that change happens. But if you actually want a functional banking system in a big, diverse country like we have, you want a lot of banks, right? So you remember during the pandemic, 
um, in when when like you needed the government was trying to push out all this money to small businesses, the mm-hmm. Paycheck Protection Program, so that the small businesses could continue to pay their employees. Well, that worked through our banking system. And as it turns out, the big banks were much worse at doing it than the small banks because small banks actually have relationships with their communities and mm. they know the business people in their communities. And so you can, you know, it's not all like this. They're not all like lending into, into Wall Street, but the big banks don't really have um, good commercial lending arms because they don't, li- you know, they're not, the people that run them don't live in the community. They live in New York um, or they live in North Carolina. And so, mm. When you shrink the banking system, yeah, sure, you make it easier for the Federal Reserve to bail out like a, a large, you know, large banks, but you also destroy the ability to allocate credit in the country. And it's not like the big banks are, you know, riskless. They're just, you're just pooling risk and making it in some ways more opaque. And I know bank regulators, like the guys that go into banks who take them over when they go under and it's like a fun job because you can you know who knows what the bank owns like sometimes the bank owns like i know this one guy who told me he's like yeah i had to i had to resolve this bank in texas and the bank owned like a foreclosed farm so he had to like figure out how to feed the cows because like the <laughs> farmer had just why he's like a bank regulator who goes in huh. and he has to find someone to take care of so that's like how it how it actually works huh. but, um but the the he also says, like, when you have a problem at a small bank or at a medium-sized bank and there's fraud or there's there's insolvency or whatever, you go in and you fix it. And that's the way it works. But when you have a problem at a big bank, you can't do anything because the big banks are so politically powerful. And so what's happened is a lot of the risk gets pooled at these large banks. And uh, it might seem riskless, which is the way that Larry Summers wants to portray it. But as we all remember, like those large banks were the center of a massive financial and political crisis in 2008, 2009. So it's like a generally irresponsible thing that Larry Summers is saying. But whatever, you know, we know that Larry Summers is just that's just what he thinks. Right. Well, but what's what was going on with Silicon Valley Bank? You know, was it just that they made a mistake that anybody could have made that wasn't necessarily negligent and investing it too, too heavily in these bonds or buying too many of these bonds that were so susceptible to high interest rates? Should they have diversified more as the regulation that could have prevented that kind of behavior? Or was this something that just sometimes happens? It's just going to happen sometimes. I mean, it, it, first of all, we've had this record increase in interest rates. So we're in a very weird position in terms of the, you know, the macro, the interest rates. And like for more than 10 years, the Fed kept interest rates at zero. So when banks wanted to borrow from or lend to each other, they, they had, it, it didn't cost anything. And it's a very strange to have capital not cost anything. It's very strange. And then during the pandemic, the, the, the early days, the, the Fed just printed trillions of dollars to make sure that people could, could borrow. And what that did is it fueled huge amounts of weird speculation, like crypto is one of it, but lots of like private equity and strange, like, like Tesla became a trillion dollar corporation. And it was just like lots of weird stuff um, and Bitcoin and all that weird stuff. And, mm-hmm. um, and so like, that's a, you don't want to have capital be costless because then what you get are, are speculative bubbles instead of investing in factories and housing and things that people need. Also, you saw a massive housing bubble, right? Which it's like, you know, housing prices went up by 40%. So people couldn't can't afford houses. So now the fed like is trying to deal with inflation and raised interest rates is raised interest rates pretty massively, like at a record pace, and it's probably going to continue raising them because inflation is not under control. And what is going to happen when you do that is you're going to have some things in the financial system break because people have invested on like for they they're you know you're you're like okay I have to put a bunch of money to work that I'm going to have to get back in ten years. That's like what an insurance company does, um, or you know any number of other companies. They're like I have a bunch of money, I have to invest it for 10, 20 years, and I need to get it back then and i'm going to invest it at 1 2% whatever the interest rate is now and then all of a sudden the interest rate goes to 5 or 6% and that like causes everything to go haywire and just mm-hmm. stuff is going to break when when that happens and there has been some stuff that broke that's been like breaking in ways that you don't necessarily see um like in england there was there was a huge like crisis with their pension funds here i mean we've seen crypto break right and like the silicon valley bank yeah, they made some bad decisions. I think it's like pretty clear they made some bad decisions. But mm-hmm. fundamentally, what's happening is the financial system is 
normalizing and the things that the institutions that were built on 0% interest rates are, um, are, are breaking. Okay. All right. I appreciate that explanation. I've been seeing, you know, Silicon Valley bank swirling around my timeline. Um, and people I don't are know, if that, it... that makes sense. I feel like I might've been no, like, too no, technical I think it, about it. I, I think that you were just the right amount of technical, uh, frankly, especially for this late stage in a detail packed podcast. I, I appreciate right. you. Appreciate your patience with us. There's one other. Oh, we did the I'm, Twitter I'm, thing. I'm proud of us, by the way, from getting through all these topics in, know, in an right? hour. But the last one up might be the most interesting, <laughs> the most right. kind of a sexy topic. And it was your Taibi take. What did you make about uh, of those hearings last week? Uh, so the hearing um, the, on weaponization of, of federal government, you know, I, I, I found it very annoying. Um, <laughs> but uh, so what so what what Taibi was saying and, and Michael Schellenberger was the government was doing, you know, was colluding with Twitter to censor people in ways that were inappropriate. And he's right about that. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, there's no question. And the Republicans brought him in to say that. And he said it. And then the Democrats like criticized him and said, are you a real journalist? Mm-hmm. Like, you're not a real journalist. It's so, it's like, so-called journal- journalist. It's so <laughs> annoying. This isn't just a matter of what data was given to these so-called journalists before us now. There are many legitimate questions about where Musk got the financing to buy Twitter. Uh, Ranking member Plaskett, um, I'm not a so-called journalist. Uh, I've won the National Magazine Award, the I.F. Stone Award for Independent Journalism, and I've written 10 books, including four New York York Times bestsellers. (laughs) And then he said, I'm a real journalist. I, like, um, you know, written 10 books, and I used to, you know, I have all these awards, and I'm like, that, I don't care. Like, no, being fancy doesn't make you a journalist, and I don't like that the Democrats are whining about who's a real journalist, and they accused him of trying to, like, profit off of, you know, the Twitter files, which was uh, that stupid well, and irrelevant. I you, you violated your own standard and you appear to have benefited from it. Before the release of emails, in, of the emails in August of last year, you had 661,000 Twitter followers. After the Twitter files, your followers doubled and now it's three times what it was last August. I imagine your Substack readership, which is a subscription, increased significantly because of the work that you did for Elon Musk. Now, I'm not asking you to put a dollar figure on it, but it's quite obvious that you've profited from the Twitter files. You hit the jackpot on that Vegas slot machine to which you referred. That's true, isn't it? I've also reinvested you've made a lot. Some... No, 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 no. Is it true that you have profited since you were, rece- you were this recipient of the Twitter files? You've made money. Yes or no? I Very think it's probably question. a wash, honestly. No, you've, you, you have made money that you did not have before, Correct. But I've also spent money that I didn't have okay. before. I just hired a I, whole group of people a, to patently obvious answer, reclaiming my time. I saw you say that. That of course, you know, you you think that there has been an over valorization um, of journalism post Watergate that isn't necessarily yeah. valid. That journalists are people and they're doing jobs, and you just judge it on the merits, but they're not necessarily heroes. And people can feel differently about that. But like, I, I also don't think that by the basic standard of what is a real journalist in anybody's imagination. Matt Taibbi wouldn't more than qualify and that the uh, attacks from Democrats of his credentials are unsubstantiated. Yeah, I agree with that. No, uh, I 100 percent agree. But let me just while we have sure. two minutes, I want to get into what I think he got wrong. Sure. Because I think and I, the Democrats sort of got at this, but they were too annoying to make the point clearly. <laughs> so Twitter is a lawbreaker as it is a serial lawbreaker and has been long before Musk bought them. So Twitter screwed up their like data security. Mm-hmm. In 2008, uh, some hacker like guessed their administrative password and then tweeted uh, on President-elect Obama's Twitter account, like, do this and you can win gas cards. Like, it was mm-hmm. like pretty embarrassing. They took over a bunch. And the Twitter and the FTC came to an agreement where Twitter said, we're going to do better security practices, which is a legally binding agreement. Mm-hmm. In 2022, they had to, like, they paid a $150 million fine because they violated that agreement. And this mm-hmm. was before Musk took them over. And what they were doing is they were asking people for their emails and phone numbers for two-factor authentication, and then using that, those emails and phone numbers to target people with ads. So they were mm-hmm. lying to their customers. And 
they were not maintaining their security adequately as they had promised. And so they, they paid $150 million and signed another agreement where they promised to do all sorts of things like have senior employees do training. And anytime they launched a product, they had to do all of this privacy analysis. And there's all of this annoying, busy work that they have to do because they kept lying to their customers. Musk gets in and immediately says, anything that you journalists want, you can have. And starts to like, and fires all the people who are managing the FTC consent decree and does a bunch of stuff that's like unlawful. You can't do that. You can't Mm. give third parties access to data that you've promised the government and your customers you wouldn't give third parties access to. It's just, that's just illegal. And then you also can't um, fire the people who are supposed to uphold the privacy commitments and the security commitments that you've made. And like, you, you can't do that. That's mm. illegal. You have multiple agreements. And so when the FTC is investigating, the FTC is not like the CIA or anything. They're still just policing big business. When they went to Twitter and they, they saw all of these indications that Twitter was violating its consent agreement, again, un, this time under Musk, they said, okay, give us all of this information about what you're doing and tell us the journalists that you shared this information with because the journalists were the third parties that they were unlawfully potentially giving data to. And what the FTC was going to do is they were going to ask, as they do with all third parties who get access to unlawful data, please delete it. User, un, like, like if, if Musk is handing over your DMs to mm-hmm. a journalist, like that's the kind of thing that they're looking out for, right? Mm-hmm. And it would be equivalent of Musk's, if the owner of AT&T saying, hey, journalist, eavesdrop on anyone's conversation you want. Like, that's mm-hmm. not cool. That's not okay. I mean, um, if, if in fact they are doing that, I mean, and, and I think the, the pushback might be, and, I'm, and I get that they'd have to demonstrate this, but the pushback might be, well, I'm, I'm being given access to internal company emails, not people's DMs. Yeah, I'm being no, that, given, right. They, they, that, that's right. And they were given access to anything they wanted, right? The point well, is- Well, I, no, 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 I don't know that Tybee and no, Schellenberger are on the co- no, Musk said that to Barry Weiss. He said anything that she wants. And the point isn't the point isn't uh, the agreement is not p- third parties have to have to get access to illegal data and use it. The, the 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 agreement is you can't give them access. Period. And like they had, they probably had access. And but so, I mean, but do, but do you but do you think though, Matt? I mean, like I I take your point, and if it is true that Elon Musk really meant it when he said you have unlimited reign, then I would agree that's a problem. But that does seem to me like a bit of puffery, like a bit of hyperbole that's used to try to, he's trying to demonstrate how generous he's being to these journalists. I mean, Barry Weiss, for one, isn't even allowed to have any, Barry Weiss can't have any access anymore at all because she she angered Musk by accusing him of hypocrisy. I know know that, but the point is, is this is is like, you're right about this. Like it doesn't, in a normal company, this is not a big deal. But the point is, is Twitter has been caught give it like screwing around with user data multiple times. So the bar for them is higher, right? And the point isn't sure that Taibi was using user data. The point is Twitter committed to the government multiple times that they were going to be really careful about who they gave access to. And then they weren't careful. That's so if like, Elon, so if Elon Musk comes back and clarifies, well, I didn't really mean she could have anything. Obviously, I'm not giving her access to my private emails. Obviously, and and other statements from Elon and some of the Twitter files journalists have indicated this that they're actually quite limited in in the searches that they are uh, the requests they're able to make. That they that there are lawyers who are running these requests for them. They're not get, have, given direct a- access right. to these documents. Taibbi was just on Bad Faith last week talking about how he feels some uh, unspoken pressure to, ha- you know, to do this quickly and to only run a certain number of searches because he's not sure how long he's going to have access. It seems clear from other statements that have been made that there are, in fact, limitations. So is it sufficient for Elon Musk to say, I didn't really mean that there's no there's no risk here of actually opening the kimono fully up? Or does the FTC, is there is there some journalistic issue with the FTC being allowed to probe the full information about what journalists are involved in a way that Matt Taibbi has framed as a, as a quote, insane overreach from a kind of journalistic First Amendment perspective? Uh, The only reason, that's the the only reason they're doing an investigation is to find out the extent of the, of the access to third party data. That's all, Mm -hmm. that's all it's about. It's like, if, if somebody keeps like giving their user data away and then they Mm -hmm. announce publicly we're going to share our user data illegally with a third party. It's completely reasonable for 
and name some of the third parties that they've like shared that data with, it's completely reasonable for the privacy regulator with whom Twitter has a commitment to say to that, like, you know, to Twitter, hey, who else are you sharing this data with? And like, what is the extent of the, the data sharing? And that's why you do an, inv- hang on, hang on. That's why you do an investigation. This isn't them convicting Twitter. This is them doing an investigation. And there is a lot of evidence that like Musk was not particularly careful about guardrails, but maybe he was. That's sure, but can't questions. you prove that? Can't can't Twitter prove that it hasn't yeah. given over since it uh, you know sure. since it information without disclosing the names of all the journalists that have been involved in the Twitter files? So, for example, couldn't it turn over all of the files that it has in fact turned over to all of the journalists while still keeping the information? It, it felt like what Tybee was objecting to was the idea that he had to expose all the people that are working for him on this new project where he's paying some folks to help him go through the files, you know. Can't can't Twitter fulfill its obligations to the FTC without ostensibly throwing all these journalists under the bus? They're not throwing journalists under the bus. They're just disclosing third parties that had access to their systems. Right. I mean, there's not and they can I mean, they don't have to like they can say in an investigation, you can go to a government um, investigator and you can say, no, we're not going to give you this information. And big businesses like Twitter do that all the time. If you want to contest it legally, you can, and they they might do that. But mm-hmm. the point is, is that like in the Washington Post, it was reported that Elon Musk texted to Barry to his subordinates, "Give Barry Weiss anything she wants." Mm-hmm. I, I, is that yeah. grounds for the FTC to like go out like convict Twitter? No. Is that grounds for them to ask? What did you give? Who did you give it to? Like, yeah, that's fine. I, I think the issue is, and I, I think you started out by saying this. That the and it, interest- by the way, this is not just about, I just took the journalist thing. This is a, a broader problem. This is about data, because that the journalist thing is what people like get obsessed with. But this is just about whether Twitter is upholding its No, no, I, I understand that, Matt, but the, the, like- the problem is this. The problem is that the what we saw in the Twitter hearings last week were was such a demonstration of bad faith by people like Pla- uh, Representative Plaskett and uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And these folks who are doing ad hominem attacks and in, in, in undermining the integrity of uh, Matt Taibbi's career and clearly triggered by the idea that what Taibbi has reported on at all would validate right-wing narratives about there being a bias against Look, I get, conservatives I of these agree companies. With that, okay? Okay, but it was so also that, bad but that being the case, but wait, 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 I mean, no, that being the case, let's, but wait a minute, wait a minute, that, that being no, the case, the- but wait a minute, Matt, let me just finish this point though. I've been trying to make this point. That being the case, even if it is true that the FTC has a valid reason to want to investigate this, it's going to be hard for people, especially people like Matt who are actually involved, to to draw the line between even if they have a valid reason to investigate whether or not this is being weaponized. And this is the same argument conservatives make about Donald Trump and the way that they raided Mar-a-Lago, right? Even if obviously he had the papers, is there a there there about how he's been treated differently than, say, Joe Biden, who also let, had let, the undocumented let me give you the, the, the documents? Let me give you the context here, OK, because you said the Democrats were operating in bad faith. Jim Jordan, OK, the, the FTC has antitrust cases against um, against uh, Facebook. They have an antitrust investigation against Amazon. They have cracked down on fraud from uh, Walmart, from uh, a whole series of companies. This is they're handling Twitter in the exact way that they've handled privacy consent decrees for like companies like GoodRx for unlawfully sharing data. They've, they have a broad, they are the police for big business. That's what mm-hmm. they do. And Jim Jordan doesn't like that. And Jim Jordan has opposed antitrust action against big business and big tech very aggressively for a long time. And he is trying to shoehorn an attack on the cop against big business into a legitimate inquiry about the extent of the intelligence community's control over, over, um, censorship, uh, over censorship. Right. And he is doing that because he wants to help Google, who is one of his donors. And he wants to help Amazon and all of the people who have helped his staff. And because he's a libertarian and that's the point here. And Mm. Matt got tricked into and Twitter is a big company. They have 300 million users. They have been caught violating user privacy multiple times. Everybody is concerned about privacy. The the Congress is on the verge of passing a federal privacy bill. Nobody likes the snooping. Everybody wants something done against big tech. If you want to deal with corporate power, you need government enforcers who can do it. 
Mm-hmm. And the FTC is one of those government enforcers. And Jim Jordan is trying to conflate what's going on. And Matt, you know, was asked by, by Representative Plaskett, did you read the consent decree? Right. Because Matt said, this is outrageous. They're asking for my name. They weren't investigating him. They were investigating Twitter. She's like, did you read the consent decree? He said, I wasn't given access to it. She, she said, but did you read it? Because it's public. Right. Mm-hmm. And and he said, no, he didn't know what the consent decree was about. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know anything about data privacy laws. He didn't realize the whole context by w- the reason that Twitter was like the FTC was asking stuff about Twitter. He just assumed, oh, well, it's just like the CIA or the FBI or whatever. And I understand why you would think that. But like, you know, I, I, it, it's not true. And, yeah. and I, I don't I mean. I'm somebody who cares about corporate power, right? And I acknowledge that, and I, I think you should break up a lot of these firms or regulate these firms because I think the censorship problem is res, is a result of their concentration of power. I think there are very serious issues here. But I think you also have to look at the regulatory side and how businesses work before you can make claims. And the claims here about like privacy law, which is what Matt was doing and unwittingly. And I, I think there's yeah. like a little bit of the, this is why I don't like the like fetishization of journalism, because it's like, mm. this is a, um, uh, this is, this is like, you are, you, uh, the right, the, the, the right to, um, uh, freedom of the press means the right to print. It means the right to tell the truth. And the government cannot encumber you from doing that. But a lot of companies claim they are the press. Like, for example, credit reporting agencies claim that when they do stuff, they have freedom of the press. And a lot of companies are doing this. Like when companies don't want to tell employees what their rights are when the government compels them, they say that is compelled speech and we are going to grab freedom of the press or the First Amendment well, to justify. That's how we got Citizens and, United, right? But they're right, Citizens United. So, so it's like, <laughs> The, the sort of fetishization of journalists as a special class with special rights is, I think, a libertarian frame. And the idea that the government can never, like, talk to any of these large companies about what they might be doing wrong, which is fundamentally what Matt was complaining about. And, and, and I know why he was, and he didn't mean it that way. But that is a libertarian frame, and it's mm-hmm. one that, that you, is not compatible with a democratic society. So that's kind of like where I'm coming at it. And I, I look, I, the Democrats were super annoying, but, um, and the Republicans, but like from my perspective as somebody who wants to deal with antitrust and these competition policy problems, like the Republicans were engaged in, in bad faith here too, because they were trying mm-hmm. to shoehorn mm-hmm. an attack on antitrust enforcers into a more legitimate inquiry. So anyway, that's kind of, it was a very annoying hearing. It was a clown show. You really <laughs> wish that they would, they would take their job more seriously. Um, and I'm in a huge, I'm a huge fan of Matt Taibbi and Schellenberg. I think their work is really important. Uh, I, you know, I like the Twitter files, parts of them, parts of them I didn't, but like, basically I'm just, we need a government. And like, that's just the reality. Yeah, I really appreciate that take. And I am all here for nuanced, informed takes that inc- include some critique of uh, the Twitter files that are from people who appreciate the underlying journalism um, that has come out of that effort. I think there's not enough of this. I, you know, I, I push back against some of that stuff with Matt Taibbi last week. And I think sometimes because there is so much in the way of bad faith attacks against him in the Twitter files, it can be difficult to internalize when totally. someone's coming from a good place. But I, I really enjoyed your thread and I'm, I'm kind of sold on your angle here. I'd be interested to see if Matt Taibbi has any other arguments about why he feels like this is a, uh, an overreach as he's described it. But it does seem to me like there are all kinds of ways to just fulfill the FTC's requests in the broader public interest and in having their privacy rights respected without doing anything that would undermine the that's, that's, that's project a fair, here. That's, so. a, that's a fair point. And I totally get why Matt wouldn't, w- would be immediately like, everyone's like, what happened to Matt Taibbi? And I'm, I'm, my attitude is like, Confess to making up Russiagate, and then you can say that if you want. But like, yeah, he's, you know, he's gotten a lot right. He's gotten more right than wrong. And Absolutely. So I'm like, I'm sympathetic. I think he got this wrong, but I'm sympathetic to his, you know, to his suspicion and to his claims. Like, I know why he did that, and I know why he wouldn't want to listen to someone like me on this. Like, I get it, <laughs> right? But I, well, maybe we can get two mats in the room together. Maybe you're gonna have a mat be mat. Matt I love off. that. I love. I love that. <laughs> I think the world of him, and uh, I'm a huge fan. Um, All right. Well, thank thank you, uh, Matt Stoller. Where can people find you in your amazing work? 
Yeah, so I am on Twitter too often at Matthew Stoller. <laughs> um, and then uh, I my Substack is big. So go to M A T T S T O L L E R dot Substack dot com. And I'm the research director at the American Economic Liberties Project. Um, so that's uh, econliberties.us. Great. Many thanks to you. Many thanks to our listeners. You know, you can get an additional episode of Bad Faith Podcast every Monday at patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast for $5 a month. Help support independent media, all those things, yada, yada, yada. Take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast. That's patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.